So I actually don't dwell at all. Um, I make decisions insanely quickly, which is, yeah. the, you know, you deal with that, with that, that other aspect of things too. So I had already decided, okay, yeah, this is the right thing. And then it's like, I tricked myself because at the end I'm like, this isn't a good idea, but I was like, no, I already made my decision. I can't go back. Like I literally held yeah. myself to that. And, yeah. and it was like, and it was because I'm like, nope, it's just cause I'm scared. Nope. We're good. No, we're good. No. But it was like a lot of spidey senses were going off. Like there was some things that at the end I was like, I should not have agreed to that. Or I should not have done that. Or I should, you know, whatever. And then it just felt like there was so much pressure. Brianna, thank you so much for coming on to the How to Pivot podcast. I am so excited that you're here. Oh, thank you so much, Sharon. I I love it. I love uh, the title of the pivot and not to mention what a perfect time to talk about it. I know. And I love, like, I know... I've known of you, like you and I haven't gotten a lot of time to spend together, but I've, you know, followed your journey a little bit because we both are women business owners. We both own tech recruiting firms or we, you know, we have and own recruiting firms right now. Um, We both have podcasts. So there's so (laughs) much that we can dive into. So we're going to just get right to it. And I wanted to bring you on, you know, because I think in business and as women, we're always pivoting like in our business life and our personal life Mm -hmm. and especially with recruiting and the industry itself. I mean, I think like every day I pivot (laughs) probably the same way. I love that you say that because it makes me feel better. (laughs) Right. I mean, every day, even like you and I, we just had a little bit of technical difficulties getting on here. I'm like, all right, let's, we're pivoting right now. So um, in case, you know, our listeners haven't heard about your background and your company, just give a high level overview of your firm and firms, your brands that you've created. That's amazing. And then we'll, we'll get into more. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I started uh, techies recruiting when I was 24 years old, uh, about a year ago, I ended up, um, the team got acquired by a firm, which is the, you know, large public fintech company, which was super exciting. I also had started because for some reason, I needed more companies. Uh, I started a Talent Perch, which is a very similar. Uh, it's still in tech recruiting. Um, we do some renaissance as well, but it's really embedding recruiters. So it's more strategic pr- approach as opposed to the transactional one I was used to, uh, which was great at Techies. Um, and then I have Thriversity, which has really, I would say, um, is a passion project. And of course, when you say passion project, you're like, you making money? But uh, we just are starting. <laughs> We're starting to, um, but I say passion because it's all about training and uh, training has been a a huge thing for me. I wanted, no one trained me. Like I didn't, or I should say, no, I didn't feel like anyone trained me. So I feel like that was something that I started on my own. And I really enjoy seeing that aha moment with recruiters as well when they're starting, you know, to do things and get it right and understand. And so, um, as you know, since you've been in the industry for a very long time, like myself, you see that recruiting has no standards. And so I really want to change that. I want to bring standards to our industry which will then in return bring respect to our industry. And don't get me started on that subject. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and then uh, last but not, actually uh, two more things. Uh, and uh, I also started uh, the Millionaire Recruiter YouTube channel, uh, which has been since like 2018. And that's been super great um, tips and tricks. And then recently, like you said, started my own podcast, uh, which is the Talent Takeover Unfiltered. And I co-host that with Taylor Bradley. And that has been a lot of fun. So it's been great. Yeah. And for anyone out there, they should definitely listen to it because it, it's great. And it's really, like you said, unfiltered. So you <laughs> kind of get the the background and the, the back, you know, the backstage talk about recruiting in the industry. So yeah, yeah that's thank awesome. You. Yeah. So how did you get started? Because I know for me, and I know a lot of recruiters, like people like they always say like they stumble on recruiting. And I think that's changed over the years, especially like with what you're doing, you're creating training programs for recruiters. And now, you know, I think it's a little bit different, but back in the day, like, how did you know that you liked recruiting and, you know, that you actually like found something that you were good at? How did it all, how did it all start? Oh my God. Well, I'll give you the the cliff notes, but um, I, (laughs) uh, of course, stumbled into it. So I actually went to fashion school and I wanted to design my own clothes, have a boutique, do all those things. And it's so funny because you're like, what, 19 years old when you're stumbling out and you're like, oh, I need money for that. 
okay, uh, how am I supposed to get money? Like, where is that coming from? Like, you need a lot of money. And so I just knew I wanted to get into sales. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but a recruiter found my resume on Monster. And I've always been, I guess, numbers driven. And so even though I was just cocktailing and bartending and whatnot, like it was still a, a, a money or a numbers driven resume. And it's because I wanted to get into sales. And my, my stepdad had been in sales for like ever, and he had to do his own business as well. And so anyways, just stumbled into it. And within my first month, uh, just, I just got it. Like, I, I don't know. Um, I'm extremely competitive. I always have been. I've always been really money motivated again, because I think that that's what gives you the freedom to do whatever you want. I, w- I think I got it because I was up against a corner. So we had a lot of job boards back then. Um, I haven't had job boards in forever. I don't know if you have, yeah. do you have job boards now. We do. do. We yeah. use um, Indeed and LinkedIn, like, you know, LinkedIn recruiter, but yeah. we also post on there, but it's definitely, it's like an added thing. Not, not, not your main. Yeah. We don't yeah. focus on that. Yeah. Well, back then it was like the almighty, like there was, there was not LinkedIn recruiter. You know, it was not a thing. Right. People were barely using LinkedIn. And so uh, there was only job boards. And since I was a, a new woman on the totem pole, there was no job board available for me except for Dice. And what's funny now is because now everyone knows Dice is the best tech, um, I think, job board there is. No one knew that back then. And so I'm like using Dice, you know, poor pitiful me, and started making placements my first month. And all of a sudden people are like, what's Dice? And they grabbed it from me. And I was like, okay, um, I guess I don't, I can't use that job. No, I have no job boards. And so I taught myself LinkedIn and then therefore I still kept doing well. And they were like, what's LinkedIn? And so I just instantly liked sharing those ideas and motivating and seeing big wins. Cause again, I was super competitive. So that's how it all began. And then I think that feeling, I think we can all relate um, that feeling of of placing someone, first of all, because the money's great, right? Let's get that out of the way. Totally, uh, but, totally. <laughs> but, but also because you realize, holy moly, like that actually changes people's lives. So the first, one of the first placements I've ever made ended up uh, was at Box, with that box.com. And as I don't know if anyone knows of them, but they went through a giant IPO quite a few years ago. And he was the ninth employee there. And he messaged me after that all happened. He was like, I've got this amazing new house. I started a company. Will you like, will you get behind this? Like, you know, what do you think? And I was like, oh my God. And I'm like this young kid, right? I'm like, wow, that's real. That was amazing. And that feeling was addicting. Yeah, for sure. I think like there's so many professions you can make a lot of money, but when you can actually impact and change someone's life, like that's always like such the bonus. And I know for me, like that's what's kept me going and staying in the industry forever. Is that, yeah, there's nothing like that feeling. So then what happened? Like, how did you go from that to having your own business? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, because I was also feeling the good in it. Actually, you know, um, have you watched the movie, uh, The Bad Guys? Do you have young kids? No. Well, my kids are there in their twenties now. <laughs> so oh, okay. I did have young kids, but. <laughs> oh my God. So I won't go on that tangent. Okay. But there's this movie that they're trying to be like the good guys and the bad guys. Hey. Yeah. Um, so I instantly felt a lot more of a connection with, with um, the industry in general. And it, it turned out to not just be about money for me. And so long story short on that, I felt like uh, it was way too transactional. Spamming was like promoted. Uh, and I just, I just didn't like it. I didn't get along with my manager at the time. Um, something had happened and I just was like on my high horse and trust me, I was, had a giant ego, <laughs> especially cause I, I, I got it right away, you know, and again, I was young. And so I walked out the door. I said, thank you so much. I don't need to be here. I don't like how I was treated, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I shocked everybody because at that time I was the highest performer mm-hmm. and, um, and they were like, that's crazy. And so then I celebrated it because it shocked so many people. I realized that I like that shock factor and that's like what drive me. And, um, and then I like when people say, I can't do something. Okay. I'll prove you wrong. Like, I just always like that. And so anyways, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that I loved recruiting. And, uh, then my boss at the time was like, Hey, are you like, do you have another job? Like what are you doing what's going on? I'm like, no, I'm just walking away. And he's like, what do you mean? Like he, didn't, he didn't get it. My mom was like in tears, you know, and uh, my stepdad, like I said, uh, my, my dad and my stepdad had had their own business. And he was like, well, what does your boss do for you that you can't do for yourself? And I was like, hmm, 
And again, because I'm 24, I said nothing. Nice. <laughs> and uh, and then I, my old boss, he he, uh, he got in contact with me and he was like, hey, and this was Friday. He was like, hey, um, don't do anything. I'm going to call you by Tuesday. I'm like, yeah, cool. So I literally thought I was just getting my way like a small child and that I was going to walk back in those doors and I was going to start working for him again. And he didn't call me. And so Wednesday morning, I started techies. And Wednesday afternoon, he called me. And then I told him, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> You're like, I got this. Yeah, did I was like, no, find, it's too late. Did you find, because I know you went on you know, from techies and then you recently sold your business and started again, you know, in the recruiting industry, did you find, or do you find that it is easier now or was it easier before in your twenties? Way easier before. Why do you think that is? Way (laughs) easier. Well, (laughs) a few reasons, a few reasons. So I came off of a high I felt untouchable, like after I sold, right? Um, And we were the only agency so far that had done that as far as contingency goes. And I thought that it was going to be just as easy. So I had reached a stage in my career. So I had, at that point, I had techies for 12 years. And so I reached a stage um, in my career that my level of success and definition of success had changed, but I didn't realize it at the time. And so it just felt like things were coming to me very easily and all the hard work was already done. So I entered talent coach and diversity with probably a big ego, like, let's be honest. Um, And I decided to build infrastructure in the org way faster than I would have and did at Techies. Because again, I'm like, been here before, nailed it before, here we go again. And also the market was fantastic. So I think the combination of all of that and also my excitement level, I get very excitable. My excitement level was at its peak. So I was just so excited. I'm so energized. I thought that this next company, especially with, with the diversity portion, with the training yeah. and combining the recruiting with it as well. So the strategy and the training was so exciting to me. And um, I'm also kind of like that, ooh, shiny new penny. Like I love yeah. shiny new pennies. <laughs> um, I was getting an itch because I, I think I, the best I can describe it is I was perhaps in a rut with techies because it wasn't challenging anymore. And so, yeah. Um, yeah so no, the second time is in a thousand times harder for me anyways. Yeah. I always think about that because I think about when I started my firm kind of the same way. It was, it wasn't, it was just the circumstance was different because I was having my first son and I thought I was going to go back to the company that I worked for. And then when I saw my son, I was like, okay, things need to shift. I don't want to leave for 12 hours a day. You know, Mm -hmm. I need to revamp. So that's how, you know, my company started. But I remember just being like in my twenties, being young, having really like fast success. Like I just instantly knew I loved it. And I was, you know, I was good at it. Like I found one thing I was good at. <laughs> and so I remember starting it and I was like, you know, it almost seemed not easy because it was definitely difficult, but just, um, I don't know. I feel like I was a little bit naive. So it was definitely easier that way. Cause I just thought I can do this. You know, I'm, you know, I've had success. I'm going to be great. But now fast forward, you know, to, today's time and even starting like this podcast or doing anything new that's different from recruiting, Mm -hmm. I find that I forget what it's like to start over and start from the beginning on something new. So I can imagine you would feel that way too, you know, starting a company. And I know we have a, you know, a shorter amount of time, this segment. So I want to make sure we're, you know, like getting everything in, but did you feel like when you sold techies and made that decision? Cause that's kind of like, I'm guessing it was kind of like your baby. (laughs) That was really hard. Like, (laughs) How did, like, what was that process, like just the mindset or thought process? Was it something that you did, like, because you finally like made that decision, you know, and I I guess I'm asking, because in my experience, of course, as a business owner for a long Mm -hmm. period of time, people will come and, you know, ask me if I want to sell my company or whatever. And sometimes you have to, it takes a while to actually go through that process and like decide, like, what do I want to do? Like, and as far as talking about pivoting, like, how do you know, Mm -hmm. like, how did you come up with that decision that it was finally like time to end that chapter and start something new? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So <laughs> I, had, uh, I had said no a few times um, yeah. and not just to them. I'll, I said no to them a couple of times as well um, to others. Yeah. And, uh, and it was cool. Like I was like, wow, what parents wise, that's a really cool company to sell to, you know? Uh, but because, you know, they wanted the team it was different. And it's not like I was staying there and I was operating on its own, just in a bigger house. Um, It was much different. 
And so I was like, well, what's best for the team? Because contingency is hard and, you know, COVID was rough afterwards. Um, and, you know, we did get through it and then it was super busy and it was great, but it's always, it's always a struggle, I think. And then it was, I think it was one of those moments where I'm like, are we all just kind of tired, you know, yeah. like, uh, like who's, who's still really doing great. And we have had a lot of amazing people and that were with me for many, many years. Uh, but again, it was like constantly struggling on working remote. How do you yeah. do a contingency team remote? Um, that's not easy. I, I found it to be more challenging than others. So I was coming up to it that time. And then I think, well, so what we decided to do was we embedded our t- a few members of the team into a firm. And we said, okay, let's try it out. Like, let's just see how it is. Let's see if we like this. Let's see if the team likes it. We had them there for three months. And, um, and then we kept the others working on contingency. And so we were trying to see like the balance and even see if maybe we like that business model because that's what talent Perch does. Right. Yeah. And so I was, I was pondering all of those things. And then, um, we surveyed the team and the team really enjoyed a firm and we'd worked with them for, for years as well as externals. And so we're like, well, as we, I feel like we've seen enough teams, we've seen enough cultures, we've seen enough hiring managers and we feel like they do it right. You know? And so um, once we surveyed the team and said, and when they asked, hey, would you stay here for longer? And they all, they all said yes. So I was like, so I kind of felt like my back was up, a, up against a wall for a little bit. Like I had tried something and they liked it. And then I'm like, what if I pull them? And then the stability of recruiting was really shaky. It was on and off. And so I was like, maybe this is better for everybody. You guys get stock. It's, uh, yeah. it's stable. Right. Um, and then I was like, and I needed a new challenge as well. So I thought if I pulled the plug, uh, which sounds sad, but if I pulled the plug, then that kind of gives everybody what perhaps they're looking for. Um, and, and, and it was, it was difficult for sure. Yeah. Would you say like, you know, cause we're talking about pivoting and, you know, trying to give some advice to other listeners on here. Was that one of like the most um, difficult pivots that you've had to make? Like, what would you say if you look back through your, you know, professional career, like what would be some of the, a couple of the most unexpected pivots that you've had to make? Definitely unexpected is hiring. So as recruiters, we, you think we're specialists in hiring, right? We should be, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but hiring for your own team. Yeah. And onboarding and training and giving them like, so you, as we, as we know, recruiting moves very quickly and there's no other choice, but to move quickly, otherwise you'll fail. And so doing all of that and being mindful to what people actually need training wise and being mindful as to who's going to be good at it and who's not. And then why are they not good at it? And finding those trends, those are really difficult. And then I think the, also the difficult pivot is when things are not going well. And to say, is this because I didn't do right by them or are they not doing right by me? Mm -hmm. Um, Or not me. I mean, like the business in general, right? Right. You know? Right. And so those pivots are very difficult. And I think almost always, um, well, for myself, I I always, I I didn't let go of people fast, uh, as fast as I should have. Um, So then it it deteriorates on the team. And I think those pivots are hard. Uh, Another hard pivot was when I bought out my business partner. That was really difficult. Um, it, and then because it's, it's always the aftermath. I think uh, we talk about the pivots and making those decisions. Those sometimes are really easy. And honestly, sometimes they're not probably thought about enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's the <laughs> aftermath that I yeah. think was really, was really difficult to deal with because there's a lot of self-doubt. So even though I knew at the time, I know a business partner was right for me, was right for the business and everyone else involved. It The aftermath was still very like, womp, womp, womp. It was you know, and then I had to regroup and I started being like, oh my God, did I do the right thing? And whenever you say that, did I do the right thing after a pivot, it sends you on like this mind of disaster. And it's, 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 I'm sure, you know, like as a business owner, yeah, Yeah. it's such a mind game as a leader. It's a mind game. I think, I think everything's a mind game, but like the higher you are on, I think the total pool, I always call total pool, the, the more difficult it is because you have other people you have to look out for. And that's hard. Yeah, no, I can totally relate. I think too, especially if you make a quick, swift decision, I think sometimes you can go, oh gosh, I hope I did the right thing. And, you know, maybe start feeling a little bit of regret. And then what happens, at least I know this has happened to me. 
I do that. And then the next time I have to make a decision, I tend to really like be on the fence. I overthink things, Mm -hmm. you know, same with like starting our business in the beginning and then having to pivot and change. I think it's always easy the first time. And then you start feeling like, did I do the right thing? Like, what should I be doing next time? You know, maybe I should think more. And, you know, I know for me personally, I would start to slow down on my decision making process. Mm. Like if I had to let someone go, for example, yeah. you know, I would keep them too long because I didn't want to feel that way again after I let them go. And, you know, so I always tend to hold on. And then recently, you know, I've, I've had to make some not not too recently, but a couple of years ago, I had to make some staffing um, adjustments. And it was like I put it off for so long that afterwards, when I finally did it, I felt like oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I should have done that a long time ago. Yeah, so, but it's hard. It, it's, yeah. And then you start thinking, okay, it's people's lives. But yeah. I think what, um, I know what I have a problem with, is like, it's my life too. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think when you're a leader for so long, you forget that. Right. And I think too, being you know a business owner, sometimes we don't have anyone else to reach out to mm. and get support. So mm-hmm. what do you do? Like, what's your support system? Like when you're trying to make a decision, and, you know, it's a big, you know, pivot that you have to make. Like, how do you, what, what goes through your, your thought process and how do you handle it? So I, well, I can tell you what I did wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think like j- just speaking to the sale, for example, yeah. which obviously yeah. was, was the biggest pivot yeah. um, is you have it in your mind that you've made it up. So I actually don't dwell at all. Um, I make decisions insanely quickly, which is yeah. the, you know, you deal with that, with that, that other aspect of things too. So I had already decided, okay, yeah, this is the right thing. And then it's like, I tricked myself because at the end I'm like, this isn't a good idea, but I was like, no, I already made my decision. I can't go back. Like I literally held yeah. myself to that. And, yeah. and it was like, and it was because I'm like, nope, it's just cause I'm scared. No, nope, we're good. No, we're good. No. But it was like a lot of spidey senses were going off. Like there was some things that at the end I was like, gosh, should not have agreed to that, or I should not have done that, or I should, you know, whatever. And then it just felt like there was so much pressure that I just had to keep going and that I would be letting people down if I did it. And then it was like, I've gone through this for nothing. So, you yeah. know, so it was, um, that was a, that was a lot there, but when I'm going through the process, I ended up getting an exec coach about three or four years ago, which was the best thing I could have done. I meet with every week. I've actually had two at this point, because I do think that you outgrow them. Um, they can take you through a long time journey and then like, you kind of like, okay, and here I am. And it's like, you're kind of going up the pillars of emotional intelligence, leadership skills and stuff like that. And then you, again, I think you outgrow, but that's to me, I think that's phenomenal. Uh, and then most recently I have reached out to a couple people that are in the industry that I respect. Mm-hmm. And, and that has really, really, really helped because I'm sure, as you know, no one gets what recruiting is <laughs> right? <laughs> and everyone, like, I mean, even my family sometimes probably yeah. doesn't get what doesn't understand what I do, you know, and it's been so long. So it is really hard. So I think what you're touching on is that one, it's difficult for, because as a business owner, completely different ballgame. And then also recruiting is a completely different ballgame. So it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I, right. I definitely... Yeah. So who do you go to? <laughs> Tell me, what do you do? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I started like a bi-monthly recruiter meetup here in Phoenix. Ah, nice. And so there's about eight of us now. It's just kind of slowly growing. But mm-hmm. um, one of the guys was on that webinar that you were on last week, Brent. Oh, which one? Oh, Brent. nice. That guy was cool. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. he's in there and it's, it is, it's so refreshing. And even though I've been doing this for so long, we get together for lunch and it's only like an hour and a half, but we go around and people ask questions or they say what their biggest challenge is. Um, We talk about goals, you know, obviously. And it's just, I mean, I feel so much better walking out. (laughs) Even though like I'm the one that set it up because I love, you know, I love being a mentor for other people that are trying to do what we're, what we've done, you know? Mm -hmm. So when people come and ask questions or whatever, I always, I just love helping them, you know? So Anyway, I started it for that reason, but I get, I think I get the most out of it. Yeah, that's, else. I mean, that's a great, that's a great idea. Like, this yes. is so good. So yeah, I think doing something in person or even virtually, you know, where you, like, we all have different, there's no direct competitors, you know, in there. We all have different areas of expertise that we mm-hmm. um, recruit on. So 
Yeah, but I definitely agree with you too. Like a coach, I also have a business coach that mm-hmm. I've used. I and I probably will do a different one. Like I try every year to pick like one thing, like one group or one mastermind or something. Cause I need to always be learning. Otherwise I get bored and I'm kind of like yeah. you, like I'm like shiny object, you know, I have to like <laughs> Stop cool. myself. Like, why? Like, yeah, like, why am I doing this? Like, what am I trying to get out of it? And sometimes it's not the money. It's, you know, it's like, because I like it, like this podcast. I'm like, it just brings me joy when I get to talk to cool people, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's pretty much why, why I started it. So, yeah, that's really good. So, definitely, like, for anyone listening out there, like, surround yourself with people that can listen and good, give good advice you know, mm-hmm. an objective or just even listen. I think that's sometimes they don't even need to say anything, right? That That is <laughs> true. So I just recently um, said something to my, or asked my stepdad for advice and he doesn't get the business. And so sometimes I don't always talk to him about stuff Yeah, because it's like, oh, I don't really get it. <laughs> uh, but he recently gave me like great advice and I'm like, you know what? I do need to talk to people that aren't in the industry because they can see it through a different lens as well. And I think not only do you have to surround yourself with people that listen, but you have to surround yourself with people that just give it to you real. Mm -hmm. Like that's, what's really important. Cause like, I I know that there's some people in my life who love them to death, but they will sugarcoat things. Oh, Brianna, you're so great. Oh, I know you'll be fine. (laughs) It's like, no, I'm not fine right now. I need to talk this out. Right. Like you don't understand (laughs) what's going on here. (laughs) Yeah. Tell me, the, tell me what you really uh, think. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's so much we can go into. Maybe you'll have to come back on. Because I, know. I know we, we have a hard stop, but <laughs> this has been so great. So last thoughts, like anyone yeah. out there that's like in a situation where they need to really make some changes, what, what piece of advice could you give them today? Write it down. So, um, I, one I'm manifesting, which I think is fantastic. So whatever, you know, you want the universe to give you and you think that you deserve and worked for actually, I even say deserve, like, cause some people have trouble with that, but, um, just write it down. I do it three times in the morning, uh, six times in the afternoon and nine times before I go to bed on what I, what I want. Are they all you know, different? It, are they all uh, different things? Or are they like the same yeah. ones, like six times the over? same ones, the same, same ones. ones. So it's like, this yeah. is what I want. It's like affirmations, yeah. right? Like, like I am strong. Yeah. I, my, you know, all those things. Um, no, it's the same thing. What's interesting is the manifestation has, um, it, it's been a journey. So like for the first like month or so it was, I was really stuck on one thing. And then the second month it morphed a little bit. So it has morphed. I've, I'm now on day 45. It sounds like I'm out. I'm on on day 45 and it has definitely changed, but it's in the same theme. It's just, I think I'm mentally getting stronger. Um, so that's really, really important. And then again, writing it down with the, with what you're thinking you want to do the pros, the cons, and then thinking the best advice that my coach gave me a few years ago was not where do you want to be in two years, where do you want to be in five? What do you want to be doing in two years? What do you want to be doing? What is your day to day? Mm-hmm. That that I thought was super powerful because you can go on so many tangents otherwise. Yeah, I love that. So do you feel, because that was a few years ago, do you feel mm-hmm. like you are doing what you I what am actually just gave me the chills. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, I'm yeah. glad that I'm talking to you today because that's something I wanted to do too. So <laughs> thank you. That's thank you so awesome. much. Yeah, sure. it's, um, yeah. uh, happy to be on whenever this is. This okay. Is we'll great. come back it's on therapeutic Let's do it again. Me. I love okay. it. So I'll let you go for now. Thanks everyone for joining us on another episode of how to pivot. And Brianna, thank you so much for being on here. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you.